Excellent. Okay, so it seems like our audio is working. Um, we're about to start in like one second. If there are any issues, feel free to direct message me. Okay, Julio, we're ready. Yeah, and I think live streaming is set up. I'm just gonna turn off my mic. Give it a minute or two for everybody to show up. But, I, I need permission to record. Oh, that's a good one. Uh, allow to record local files. Yes. Okay, you should have it now. Thank you. Go. And attendees should still be. Attendees are still trickling in. Okay. You should see the number of attendees. Once it stops getting bigger and bigger and bigger, then most people are in. I think we should start. We're at 30 participants. Okay. So we're going to go ahead and get started. Welcome everyone to our plenary session for our 33rd annual conference. Um, this is a very special session. As you know, the plenary session, while we've had very high quality um, concurrent sessions that have been going on all day yesterday and got started this morning at 10 a.m., 7 a.m. for those of you who are joining us from the West Coast. Um, at the, for the plenary session, we stop and convene and bring everyone together who's participating in the conference to focus on a special topic that is close to the theme of the conference. And so this session, um, Haiti in Crisis, was proposed early on, um, even before the latest crises um, developed. So in May, the panelists um, proposed this session to have a conversation about um, underlying factors about what we see going on in Haiti and to put it in social, economic, and historic context. I'm gonna turn it over to the chair of our session, Chip Perry from Georgia State University, and he will introduce our speakers. Thank you very much, Regine. Welcome everybody in our, our, our audience, no longer in the waiting room. Uh, we have uh, a limited amount of time, so I'll quickly introduce our speakers. Each one will define crisis as they choose. Some will be more structural, some will be more structural, some will be more episodic. Of course, we've had recent headlines with the assassination in July, the earthquake in August, uh, and associated events more recently, including the Del Rio migration crisis at the, at the southwest border of the United States. Um, Alex Dupuy, uh, Professor John Andrus Emeritus of uh, Wesleyan University will be our first speaker and he'll focus on general uh, world system and other political economic effects uh, of and causes of, these cri of the crisis. He'll be followed by Robert Faton, um, another endowed chair professor from U University of Virginia. And Robert will also look at a structural approach to the current crisis, looking particularly at its more and intermediate causes and consequences. Uh, he will be followed by Ann Fuller, who's a resident of Haiti and is also, uh, I, for as long as I've known, in the late 1980s has been involved with the Haitian cr crises, uh, working for Human Rights Watch, then called America's Watch, uh, and the National Coalition for Haitian Refugees, all the way in through various UN missions in Haiti and other countries, and has authored some chapters recently in her quote unquote retirement. Um, then we, a fourth speaker will be Renaud Barrette, who is the president of Xavier of New Orleans, Xavier University of New Orleans, uh, who was born in Haiti, but is a DACA child, um, except um, he's certainly been regularized and is, was the host of the Haitian Studies Association meeting in 2018, uh, which was a terrific uh, uh, reunion for many Haitian scholars. Finally, I, I, I will speak to the migration crisis and some of its causes and consequences uh, and some of the interesting nuances that have not been covered in the press. So without further ado, I turn it over to Alex. Well, thanks, Chip. Uh, it's a pleasure and honor for me to, to be with you today. So I'll try to keep within the time limit uh, as much as possible. <laughs> so, All right, let me start with some basic indicators of Haiti's economy 
to put um, the rest of my remarks in the context of, um, in context. Um, Haiti has a, a population of 11 million with 52% of that population living in rural areas. 58.5% of the population is poor and 24% extremely poor. 12% of the extremely poor live in urban areas and 5% in Port-au-Prince, in the Port-au-Prince metropolitan area. Approximately 69% of the people population now rely on the transfers from Haitian immigrants and such transfers account for 20% of Haiti's gross domestic product. Now, uh, Haiti is a highly stratified uh, class society. At the upper end of the scale, the wealthiest 10% appropriate nearly 50% of the national income, in contrast to the lowest 10% who receive 0.7%. The top 1% of the population has 50 times more resources than the bottom 10%. Taking these indices as expressions of the class structure of Haiti, the top 1% that appropriates much of the wealth and 50 times and has 50 times more resources than the bottom 10% comprise the men and women of the Haitian ruling class. Now, um, the, they own the principal means of production, such as the major industries and businesses, including the subcontracting uh, assembly manufacturers in partnership with foreign investors, um, and, the, and the, also the largest estates. The 10% who appro appropriate nearly 50% of the national income could be considered a middle class comprised of professional men and women, both in the urban and rural sectors, owners of small businesses, managers of public utility com utilities, companies and services, and public and government officials. Given the limited opportunities to improve one's standard of living in the economy, one can understand why in Haiti, politics is considered a zero-sum game, wherein those who come to power seek to enrich themselves through corruption and to prolong their hold on power for as long as possible, whether or not they were elected to office. This also explains why removing presidents by force has been a constant in Haitian politics since it became independent. To put the assassination of Jovenel Moïse in the broader context of Haiti's tumultuous presidential history, Haiti had 21 presidents between 1804 and, and before the U.S. occupation of Haiti in 1915. 16 of those presidents were overthrown by coup d'etats or uprisings, four others died in office, and only one completed his term. There were three presidents under the American occupation and 11 between 1946 and 2021. Four of them were overthrown, and one other, Jean-Bertrand Aristide, has the distinction of being overthrown twice, the first time after he had served seven months in office and three years after his second five-year term. As I mentioned, we still don't know why Moise was assassinated or who did it. What we do know is that he had become increasingly unpopular. For over a year, Moise, was, who assumed the presidency in, in February 2017, had been plagued by an opposition movement seeking to remove him from office. From mid-September to early December 2019, the country was gripped by massive and at times violent and deadly demonstrations in the capital city of Port-au-Prince. Um, and other provincial cities demanding his resignation. Moïse had also been accused of uh, stealing money from the Petro-Caribe funds Venezuela had given to Haiti by allowing the Haitian government to resell Venezuelan gasoline and diesel on the domestic market at a higher price than it paid to Venezuela. But with Venezuela facing its own economic and political crisis since Nicolas Maduro was reelected in 2018, the Petro-Caribe agreement with Haiti ended that year. That inevitably led to an, to an end to the fuel subsidies and rising prices at the gas pump. But the protests were also fueled by the glaring social and economic inequalities 
the crushing poverty of the majority and the flagrant corruption and impunity of elected or appointed officials. Confronted with a growing and, and steadfast opposition against him, Moise sought and won the support of US President Donald Trump by agreeing to vote with the US not to recognize the new Maduro government at the meeting of the Organization of American States in 2019. The growing popular against, movement against Moise, however, led many civil society, labor unions, women's, peasants, and religious organizations to demand Moise to step down and be replaced by a Supreme Court judge to serve as interim president until new elections could be, could be held. But knowing that he had the backing of the US, Moise and, and his ruling party rejected that agreement. It was also at that time that Haiti saw a drastic increase in gang violence and kidnappings in the poorer neighborhoods of Port-au-Prince that led to the displacement of nearly 20,000 people from their homes. With a weak police force incapable of stopping them, the situation is getting increasingly more and chaotic and dangerous by, by the day. The question is, where does Haiti go from here? Many civil society organizations recently called for the organization of new presidential and parliamentary elections. But as I suggested above, it is not at all clear to me that while they may be desirable, national elections could be held under conditions of widespread insecurity and anarchy. Moreover, in the absence of a well-organized popular movement that could challenge the status quo and propose meaningful alternatives to address the fundamental interests and needs of the majority of Haitians, they could well amount to plus ça change, plus c'est la même chose. With that, I will end. Thank you. Thank you, Alex. That was great. Well under the time limit. Robert, you're on. Well, thank you so much. Uh, Alex has covered part of what I was going to say, but I will go ahead and try to uh, say things that he may not have said. So uh, the assassination of uh, Jovenel Moïse on July 7th was the morbid symptom of a simmering institutional decay in, and persisting patterns of inequalities that are clearly accentuated by severe poverty. While the end of the Duvalier dictatorship generated great hopes for economic development and the instauration of democracy, the past three decades have instead been marred by unending instability. All the elections held since Duvalier's departure occurred in a climate of violent political clashes and contested results that have eroded the legitimacy of the political system. They have led to coups, repression, and multiple foreign interventions. Now, an understanding of Asian politics requires considering the opportunistic convergence of interests cementing Haiti's political class and traditional economic elite with the major Western powers led by the United States. This convergence dates to Haiti's independence in 1804 and subordinate integration into the world system. It has contributed to the increasing saliency of what I've called belly politics, whereby those seeking public office electorally or otherwise do so to acquire the illicit spoils of power. Politics becomes a business of wealth accumulation that saps any collective sense of civic obligation. For the past 40 years, the neoliberal economic programs promoted by international financial institutions have compounded these problems and resulted in obscene inequalities and the failure of the so-called reconstruction that followed the 2010 earthquake. Moreover, these policies have led international donors to marginalize the state, promote export-oriented strategies based on cheap labor, and favor a type of NGO development that has neglected food production. Not surprisingly, this neoliberal cocktail has contributed to the devastation of local agriculture, a rural exodus into ever-expanding urban slums, and a massive immigration to other lands. In the process, the weakening of the Haitian state has reached the point where it is incapable of providing minimal services to its citizenry. The realities of acute deprivations have compounded this crisis of the state, 
a nurtured opportunistic strategies of survival based on corrupt forms of patronage and criminal combinaison. This environment has fueled a pervasive search for easy money that has degenerated in multiple networks of banditry, uniting members of the lower, middle, and upper classes with businessmen, politicians, and security officers at the highest level. In fact, criminality is now threatening the very survival of the state. In June 2020, nine of the most powerful gangs in Port-au-Prince federated into an uneasy alliance known as the G9 Enfamy. This criminal cartel controls vast areas of the capital and has been responsible for kidnappings, extortion, and random killings. A few days ago, in a brazen demonstration of power, one of its key leaders, Jimmy Cherizier alias Barbecue, prevented Prime Minister Ariel Henry from commemorating the assassination of the nation's founder, Jean-Jacques Dessalines at Pont Rouge in the north of Port-au-Prince. A few hours later, accompanied by a large crowd of followers and armed with guns and flowers, Cherizier honored Dessalines at Pont Rouge itself. And finally, the wave of kidnappings culminating in the recent abduction of 17 American and Canadian missionaries by the gang Katsama Wuzo has demonstrated the utter fragility of the state. The generalized insecurity has raised the specter of another intervention of foreign peacekeeping forces in Haiti and demonstrated that the governing class and the economic elite have no national project. They have accepted a pattern of dependence on external forces, securing their own continued political survival and material well being to the detriment of the rest of the population. Unless things change radically, Haiti will remain what I have called an outer periphery, and its citizens will continue to migrate in search of a better life. As an outer periphery, Haiti is under international tutelage and enjoys a very restricted sovereignty. Its democracy is a simulacrum that poorly conceals authoritarian abuses, the gangsterization of society, and systemic corruption. Politics in the system is nothing but a zero-sum game of power played out by a relatively privileged minority competing for supremacy. Public and elected officials proclaim their allegiance to the Constitution while continuously violating it. Since his death, Moise's supporters have attempted to transform him into a defender of the marginalized majority and a reformer attacking oligarchs and corruption. In fact, Moïse did little to change the system. He was handpicked by his predecessor, Michel Martelly, and elected in November 2016. He received 50% of the vote in an election marred by fraud and with barely 21% of those eligible casting their ballots. When he took office in February 2017, Moïse was quite unpopular. I'm not going to say much more about his impopularity because Alex uh, covered uh, that uh, part of Moise's rule. What is important to note, however, is that when he prolonged illegally and unconstitutionally his term by one year, uh, the international community supported that decision. And in addition, the international community supported his pledge to hold a constitutional referendum as well as general elections. Uh, those were supposed to have taken place in September, but as we know, with his assassination, the elections and the referendum never took place. The assassination left a complete void of authority, an inoperative constitution on a broken down judiciary. Haiti had no president, a totally dysfunctional judicial system, and two de facto prime ministers. Initially supported by the international community, the so-called incumbent, Claude Joseph, was abruptly rebuked in favor of Ariel Henry, whom the president had designated prime minister just days before his death. On July 20th, at the urging of the core group led by the United States, Henry became prime minister and pledged to make his government more inclusive. He also promised to reestablish state authority, create a new electoral council, and organize a constitutional referendum next February, 
as well as new elections by the end of 2022. In addition, he committed to continuing the investigation into the very mysterious circumstances of Moise's assassination. Henri's task is monumental, and I think he's going to fail. The recent natural catastrophes that have devastated the nation's southern region and the migratory crisis with the Dominican Republic and on the Mexico-US border have resulted in the deportation of thousands of Haitians back to their homeland and complicated matters for Henri. Moreover, his failure to check the generalized insecurity created by the violent gangs and his phone conversation with Joseph Badiou, one of the alleged architects of Moise's assassination, immediately after the president's killing, have raised serious concerns about his leadership. Finally, Henri's promise to hold a referendum on a new constitution that has barely been debated is unlikely to solve Haiti's problems. It is true that the prime minister reached an agreement on September 11th with members of the opposition, as well as former supporters of President Moïse. So far, however, none of the agreed upon actions have been implemented, except for the dismissal of the controversial electoral council that Moïse had appointed. In addition, large sectors of civil society that have called for a so-called Haitian solution to Haitian problems portray Henri as an unlawful imposition by the international community. They seek a transitional government of national unity before rushing into elections as requested by the United Nations and the US. They argue, and I think correctly so, that organizing a referendum on elections amid current conditions of logistical unpreparedness, political polarization and insecurity can only lead to an illegitimate outcome. While a transitional government could provide the ideal framework for delivering a Haitian solution to the country's problems, its creation requires that Haiti's political class and civil society reach a national compromise and overcome the international community's call for a rapid solution. The current constellation of forces makes this project unlikely, but unless such a compromise crystallizes, Haiti may again suffer the presence of foreign troops on its soil. And as we know, the history of such external military interventions shows that they exacerbate Haiti's problems and leave a trail of sorrows. They have, and ever, those interventions address the deep inequalities of Haiti's political economy that are in fact the cause of the country's current predicament. Thank you. Thank you very much, Robert. Anne? Hi, good morning, everyone. Um, thank you, Robert and, and Alex, um, for your very strong presentations. I'm looking at what I have been planning to say and cutting out things. And I'm planning to concentrate on um, concentrate on some of the recent history that brought us to uh, the crisis that we're in now and what it's like for people living in Port-au-Prince at this point now. Um, and I'm, I'm privileged and honored to be part of such a, a panel of such distinguished scholars as someone who is not a scholar, but an amateur here. Um, life in Port-au-Prince right now is worse than at any time in, the mem in living memory. Um, I say that as someone who studies the Duvalier regime, who has always resisted people who say, uh, oh, things were better back then. I had um, so many reasons to say that, that that was not true. I don't say that anymore. Um, the Duvalier uh, terror, the coup d'etat of 1991 to 1994 were terrible times. Um, when um, people were, were targeted and killed, and imprisoned and tortured. But the numbers of people, the proportion of society that was uh, impacted was relatively small. Right now you have half the country um, at least living under the, the pressure of, uh, of terror and insecurity and increasing poverty. Um, where 
I, I, I sometimes I was setting out to prepare this, uh, this presentation. I find myself defending the idea that there is a crisis in Haiti. This comes from, uh, I guess, from being in Haiti and talking to people in the United States who they get bits and pieces of what's going on, but they just can't understand how really, really bad it is in Haiti. Um, but the, the also the question is what kind of crisis? And, and, and particularly, I want to end with saying, how do we move forward? How do we get out of it? And I don't have the answers. I just have a lot of questions. Um, the Nouvelliste in an editorial this week uh, called Watch a Country Die said a country, a state, a nation that is decomposing before our eyes, evaporates, disappears, and without many people worrying about it. Outside of Haiti, the name of Somalia is increasingly uh, mentioned, the Somalia of the Americas. Um, the foreign minister of the Dominican Republic warned that Haiti is fit, that the Caribbean is facing the danger of a Somalization of Haiti. This is something um, very terrible to hear. Um, uh, Alex spoke about the uh, pervasive poverty in Haiti, the extreme poverty, um, rural poverty. I want to point out that in the last three years, Haiti's economy has contracted. 2018 contracted 3.4%, 2019, 1.9%. In 2020, 3.8%. I don't know what's, what's expected for 2021, but I doubt that it's good. That means behind all the crisis of governance, of violence, of insecurity, you have deepening poverty. And this the, that deepening poverty extends beyond Port-au-Prince metropolitan area, because people all over the country, um, a friend in Mirbalé who has not particularly afraid of violence or kidnapping up there, but hasn't been able to get um, to transport agricultural produce for months and months um, after gangs at Matisson um, kidnapped a truck and, and took, people, uh, took people prisoner. And so that the everything kind of grinds to a halt, everything is difficult. Farmers have a harder time selling their produce. Um, of course, Marchand can't travel to the South. All of these things uh, exacerbate the, the political and the, the political and security crisis that is focused in Port-au-Prince. Um, key elements in, in understanding the crisis, the police. We've, uh, Alex and, uh, and Robert have talked about the inability of the police to deal with the, uh, the spiraling out of control gangs. Jimmy Cherizier and the others who are moving well beyond the city of Port-au-Prince, they're in Quadibouquet, they're occasionally in other places in the Artibonite. And at this point, it's not clear uh, where they're gonna stop. The police, the resignation of the um, incompetent uh, director of the police this last week, the appointment of someone that nobody knows anything about, or nobody, I don't know whether he's any good, what is the reason he's been named. There's an, in, within the police, there's an opacity, um, much more than there used to be. The police used to have press conferences and tell you more about what's going on now, even when there is something like the breakout from the prison in Quadi Bouquet in February of this year, 445 prisoners escaped. Very few of them were captured. There's no statement from the police. There's nothing from the government. Uh, there's a sense of, uh, is the government there? That's what you often feel. Is it, is it there? What is it doing? What is the prime minister doing? Um, the police, you know, the, the police were created in 1994 after Aristide's first return. And in those first five years, there were steps forward toward professionalization. 
Those of us watching that development were very critical of a number of elements, the inclusion of former members of the FAD in it and so on, but it was generally moving forward. But in, in uh, under the, after Aristide returned to Haiti in 2000, I mean, in his second term of office from 2001 to 2004, there was politicization and destabilization of the police. Um, when Gérald Lautotu came in as, as interim president or prime minister from 2004 to 2006, there was an effort begun to restructure and rebuild the PNH. Um, René Préval in his two terms in office respected the autonomy of the police largely. Um, he didn't try to put his own people in or uh, distort the promotion system. He generally respected it. Under Martelly, the pressures on, on the credibility of the police uh, increased. And under Jovenel Moïse, uh, things got much, much, much worse. Uh, I do know that there, until yesterday, there was no arrest warrant out for Jimmy Cherise Barbecue. Even though he's wanted for so many crimes, there was Mandat d'Amné, but not a Mandat d'Arrestation. Now there is one related to the Pong Rouge action, but um, nobody believes that, that the police are able to arrest gang leaders in Haiti. <laughs> I, I spoke of, of periods when the police grew, you know, at, at a certain time, let me say up at, uh, during Preval 2009, 2008, even under, uh, after uh, Martelly first came in, one could say that the police were the, the most respected institution by ordinary people in Haiti. That's absolutely no longer the case. They're as bad or worse as other government institutions. But there, there was something. There was um, a core that was moving in the right direction, but that's ended. <laughs> there was no comparable improvement in the justice system in, in these last 25 years. <laughs> Even during these periods, during Preval's mandate, um, when there was no active uh, effort to corrupt the justice system, there was very little progress. Um, very few uh, enquêtes um, reached, uh, reached an end. Very few trials were started. Prolonged pretrial detention remained uh, a given. Today, there are 82% 80, of the prison population in Haiti is, is uh, awaiting trial, has not yet uh, seen, has seen a judge, but has not yet been, been to court. Um, it, since, and since 2018, the justice system has functioned for about three or four months every year. This is because of insecurity, Bar barricades, and also because of strikes by the judges, by the greffier, by other elements against all kinds, all kinds of legitimate reasons to protest, but it's meant that justice is essentially inaccessible for the vast majority of people, especially criminal justice. Civil courts, somewhat functioning, but, civ but criminal justice, <clears throat> It's impunity or it's, it's arrests of people who then linger in prison without a lawyer unable to get out. An element of the crisis now is the proliferation of, of small arms, of illegal guns. <laughs> it's estimated there are four to 500,000 weapons in Haiti now. That's <laughs> more than double of a figure that was um, found by researchers in 2005, which was 210,000 small arms. Excuse me a moment. <coughs> and if you could wind up, that would be great. Okay, all right. Uh, Haiti, Haiti is even exporting arms illegally to Jamaica. There are deals between Haitian gangs and Jamaican gangs, apparently, according to 
uh, reporters in Jamaica that <laughs> so many weapons coming into Haiti that they can afford to sell them to Jamaican gangs. Oh, just a minute. <laughs> So this this crisis, this crisis, perhaps the worst worst that we've seen in our lifetimes, um, threatening the very existence of Haiti. How do we how do we move forward? How do we get out of this? How do we how is there any is there any possible solution? What do people want? Now we know there are there are accords. Uh, <clears throat> Excuse me, I'm really having trouble speaking. <clears throat> All right, I'm going to be extremely brief. I think um, uh, there's a lot of agreement on the kind of government Haitians would like to see, the, uh, a government that can hold elections, can fix the justice system, can uh, imp uh, professionalize the police again, that perhaps can uh, help develop a, a new, better constitution that can create jobs, that can invest in agriculture, invest in electricity and other infrastructure. Number one, uh, bring back an element of security to life in Port-au-Prince. That's number one before anything else can be done. But how do you get there? How do you get there? Um, the elephant in the room is foreign intervention. It's it's. Uh, as uh, Robert spoke about, the, the foreign event intervention in the past has had a very mixed um, effect, not, a, not one that we can say is very positive. And often it's, I mean, we we'll go back to the occupation um, by the United States in the early part of the 20th century. We can't say very much good about it, but where we are now, if the situation continues as it is now, the gangs barbecue, the others will become stronger. Um, they will expand their, their, their control in the country. And the misery of ordinary people will be prolonged and probably worsened as the, as the years and as the months and years go on. So with this kind of choice, what, what do we do? What, how do we, can we talk about what the solutions are and not the long-term ones only, but the, but the short-term ones. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anne. And sorry about your cough, you're a real trooper. Uh, Renaud? Well, thank you. I will try to be somewhat brief, but I may not. But uh, if I begin, I wanna thank Alex and uh, Robert uh, for giving us a historical perspective, especially about uh, where Haiti has been. And especially to understand that, to even take us away from a certain nostalgia about our history, given that we have had a government that are essentially not attached to the rule of law, but also government that are attached to essentially a winner-take-all political system, where whoever comes to office uh, uh, or his party will actually hold on to office and cannot let go. And I mean cannot let go because after stealing and crimes and things like that, how do you let go because there are consequences to letting go? Uh, I want to thank Anne for especially for giving us the current historical, the current situation, which is very different in some ways. But also, I would highlight one important point that was also celebrated at some point that the Preval government actually was an exception in some ways because Preval did something that no Haitian politician had done before him in a very long time. He stepped out of office and went home and did not leave the island, which was counter the, the usual narrative where one is, thrown, is, is overthrown, killed, or whatever that somehow the rule of law and the possibilities of, of orderly transitions of power are not something Haiti is used to or is willing to accept at this point. The other piece that I pick up from Anne especially is also the fact that Haiti may be in what I call a phase transition. A phase transition because it is very different from the past. It is a moment that basically that is existential where uh, essentially that, let's say as Anne would say, if the gangs were to continue prevailing as they would, I don't know if we give the international community any choice but to allow the situation to go on forever. So the choice will be taken out of Haitian hands. The other piece that I came to speak to was something that Chip and I had spoken before, before President was assassinated, was the issue of exactly, not just the rule of law, but also the role of the diaspora. 
The Haitian politics at this point has been to keep the diaspora at a certain distance, except to contribute with revenue. And so the diaspora is not in the political system, as opposed to, for example, the Mexican system where uh, at every Mexican consul during an election, Mexicans, wherever they are, illegal immigrants in other countries or legal immigrants in other countries can come and vote are part of, are part of the political question. The diaspora for Haiti, especially given that, and I'm speaking from my position as a scientist, I'm an immunologist, I'm a biochemist, I've, and I engage with significant numbers of other Haitian scholars who are professors, both in the United States and elsewhere at the very highest levels. And likewise, there are, there's Haitian knowledge in, 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 in universities, in the political science, social science, and medicine and health. Incredible knowledge. And, and, and one can see their contributions elsewhere, but not in Haiti. Why not? Because they're not invited to be part of that. That solution also is that the diaspora brings what I call outsider's eyes. Because of having lived elsewhere, they can see what is also possible and how to engage in politics that is not winner take all. So the diaspora by being excluded from Asian politics takes away from us a crucial possibly of, possibility of renewal and also of, our, 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 of, of repair of, of where we are. Given that we are, I would say, in a phase transition. Phase transition, as we, we are about to become something else that we've never seen before, if we allow it to continue. And the, 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 part, the example of diaspora that, 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 I began, that we had have conversations over many years is that there are certain key examples of exactly how Haiti has used science or face, face, face new science, but also other wise examples in health. The coronavirus pandemic is one example that basically there is expertise, very wide expertise as to how even a poor country like Haiti and other poor countries have managed the pandemic quite differently because there was advice to the political structure. You have a knowledge base that in Haiti never take, it can avail itself of. And I would take, for example, the other example of the science is that scientists who can have examples about in development, but also of the environmental crisis that Haiti has been for a very long time. Haiti is, the, the production of Haiti is actually linked to its environmental situation, not just uh, 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 its economic or class situations. That there are ways that, if I take an example of, uh, which is an unusual example, using the, the US Academy, the National Academy of Science in the United States, and also in, uh, in, in Europe, those in Europe as well, who are not beholden to the government, but who also a resource the government uses to advise it to make crucial decisions. I'll take an example that we understand even further. If we go back to the HIV crisis, when AIDS was actually killing people, not just only in Haiti, in the US, but also in Europe. It was rapidly attached to the Haitian, that the disease arrived in the United States from Haiti. There was no response from the Haitian government. The Haitian government was incapable of responding to that, to that issue. The simple issue that Haitian scholars and American scholars here would ask simple questions that, that since the CDC was the only disseminator of pentamidine, the drug that was used to treat pneumocystis screening, every patient was in its database. They could simply ask the question, was the, were the Haitian patients recent arrivals or former arrivals? 20 years later, when they looked at that, of course they were recent arrivals because the disease had come from the United States and Europe to Haiti and now and we were seeing. But the Haitian, the ha Haiti had no resource to actually address that issue. So one of the pieces in diaspora that we have, the diaspora brings economic resources. It brings social and cultural resources. It brings political resources to Haiti, but it's excluded. You know, just for example, an anal analogy to the Academy of Sciences using resources in the diaspora and in, turn in, in Haiti, a group that is in independent of the government, would be a resource to the Haitian government in developing. And I use the sciences quite broadly, not just the physical or life sciences, but also the science and the social and other, and, and other fields that are key to the development of that issue, that those important conversations. But also broadening the question of the diaspora is that you have a group that understands the political development other than what has been the historical development of I win, I take, I destroy. So how do we begin a, a renewal? That renewal will have to be not just an, an issue of saying a new election, the government would know, we need constitutions that provide for orderly transitions. We need a rule of law that is not able to be accessible by the current government and, and changed by the current government. So you need a different constitutional approach, but you also need the possibility that the presidents would actually rule in a way that they are cautioned that basically I cannot rule outside the law because then I have no future. But in that way, that is a model that comes from outside of Haiti and it cannot be attached to history, to history, which has been basically a winner-take-all history that we cannot be too nostalgic about. I'll stop here.
Thank you very much, uh, Renault, for that perspective and filling in some of the gaps of what we obviously can't possibly uh, totally cover in this short time. I will speak to migration crisis, which is uh, both a symptom of the other crisis, but also a cause of crises uh, around the hemisphere and, and the United States. It doesn't necessarily have to be that way, but it plays out with ramifications in politics far beyond the obvious issue at hand, which is what to do with qu this quote unquote invasion of these people from s whole countries as the former 45th president of the United States uh, immoderately and irrationally posed Haitians in his mind. I'm going to try to answer four quick questions you know, in roughly two minutes each uh, and then tie it all together. The first is what is causing the Haitian migration historically and currently? Second, why are there double standards against Haitians compared to other people in the world, at least on its face, a double standard? And look at what are the remedies uh, towards these double standards, especially through the asylum system, the temporary protective status system, uh, and uh, other means of relief. Uh, and finally, why is there pushback in favor of Haitians? And why we actually, in many cases, the migration crisis echoes what we see in Haiti, which is an effort generally to restrict and exclude Haiti from the politics of the hemisphere to keep its problems uh, self-contained, and then spasmodic interventions uh, in this case, to assist migration because it's undeniable at a certain point that it's causing problems in Haiti, it's causing problems in the United States, and of course, it needs structural reform, followed by another period of restriction, uh, exclusion of foreign interventions, and non-activity other than business as usual. All right, well, we have a situation now where uh, generally, there was no Haitian migration to the United States for, through asylum applications until 1963, September, when Duvalier Papadoc held his first plebiscite. And it's the only plebiscite, even by the standards of bogus elections, that said there were absolutely no votes against him. Um, then the flow started under Jean-Claude, his son. Uh, and by 1979, an estimated 7,500 visas were issued to Haitians arriving on Florida shores. Uh, there was an attempt then to uh, detain them and allow a process for applying for asylum, but there was not a legal process in the United States for asylum applications until the Refugee Act of October 10, 1980, uh, when the Carter administration allowed for uh, Cubans and Haitians to come into the country during the episode of the Mario Boatlift and the obvious uh, corresponding policy being restrictive towards Haiti when conditions were, uh, to put it mildly, just as bad. Uh, in 1981, 81 September, Reagan and Duvalier established their famous treaty. It's treaty under international law. It was actually an, an executive agreement under US constitutional law uh, but it allowed for the interdiction of Haitian boat people, not only in the high seas, which violates freedom of the seas, a core principle of international law, but even in the Haitian territorial sea, where boats were destroyed, Haitians were returned to Haiti, uh, and a, it was an attempt to stop this flow through the Northwest Northwind Passage, uh, past Santiago, Cuba, through the Bahamas, onto Florida. Uh, and one of the most iconic images uh, that we had early in these days was the, pic the just photos that came out of the Coast Guard cutters uh, destroying the boats and uh, returning Haitians without any due process. Eventually during the coup regime, uh, civilian led military backed uh, government when Aristide was in exile in the early 1990s, initially the Coast Guard was returning 99% of the people to Haiti, even after they held uh, so-called asylum proceedings on board the cutters. This was a regime where FRAP was estimated to have killed 3,000 political dissidents, and there was a general feeling of terror to which Anne referred to earlier in her remarks. Uh, then various lawsuits occurred, and the, uh, Bruce Wright, Bruce let him loose Wright, the judge, and Sterling Johnson, and other famous judges 
um, ordered that some kind of due process hearing was established and then Guantanamo was became its first manifestation beyond just a huge naval base as a detention center prior to the 9-11 uh, events that led to the secret detention center there. And lawsuits led to due process hearings where a third of those uh, brought by the Coast Guard cutters to Guantanamo were granted asylum. The rest, uh, we don't know what quite happened to them. They were returned eventually back after Aristide's reinstatement in October, 1994. Uh, we can say then that uh, the asylum system is the process that gets the most attention as a remedy to the migration in Haiti. But in fact, temporary protective status with an irregular uh, uh, status has been the largest by far example of legal Haitian migration uh, after an illegal entry into the country. So what is causing this flow? We can say there are push factors and pull factors and time doesn't allow me to go into much depth. Uh, there's academic theory of Josh DeWin that subsidized agriculture displacing the rural peasantry with below market process dumped on the Haitian market led to rural migration to the cities and rural migration straight to Florida on boats. There's the moral economy debate versus rational choice debate about surviving under situations where the country used to be self-sufficient in food. Uh, we have world systems theories that say that uh, it's necessary for the periphery to provide cheap labor uh, and a lumpen proletariat uh, into the United States and elsewhere uh, that creates this dual policy that's a paradox. On the one hand, it's officially against illegal migration and irregular routes into the country. On the other hand, the capitalist system finds it very convenient to have a workforce that uh, suppresses wages, is docile in the face of threats of, uh, of, of arrest, detention, and removal from the country. Um, and of course, there are other factors at work inside Haiti that have been already specified, but I would merely add that the establishment, not only of a patrimonial state instead of a rule of law state, that prevents the enforcement of just uh, arrests and prosecution of real criminals, including the organized crime wave, but also the participant pattern of sultanism in Haiti, uh, Max Weber's theory of personalized rule with extreme uh, integration of loyalists and exclusion of false enemies against the state uh, becomes an end and a system unto itself is a, a, an avenue that I've explored in a book chapter in the forthcoming book that Robert and I have uh, co-edited. Uh, we can say then that uh, the United States has double standards towards Haiti with an ebb and flow of occasional uh, efforts to make it possible for Haiti to Haitians to remain in the country because they are a model minority, because there's a civil rights movement in the country that uh, from time to time responds to egregious practices like the iconic photo. In September, uh, the Custom and Border Patrol the horsemen apparently whipping with the reins of the, of, of, on the horse, uh, the poor migrant trying to wade across the dam of the Rio Grande into Del Rio, Texas similar to the photo of the dead Syrian on the Turkish shores that mobilized Germany to admit a million Syrians in, 19, in 2015 within just one year. Um, compare this with affirmative asylum cases. Uh, Haitians, which close proximity to the United States, only 3.4% of the total uh, affirmative uh, actions uh, in the United States have been given to Haitians, and those are mostly Haitians with legal visas. The affirmative system in the United States, as you may be aware, uh, is generally for people who have come in legally, generally corporate executives, who somehow claim they're victims of persecution back home and are granted asylum and the right to stay and work in the United States indefinitely, unless they commit a felony. The defensive action is the one where you get all the Hollywood action against judges that are under Article Two that are under not under the uh, much more rigorous rules of the independent judiciary in Article Three of the U.S. Constitution. Uh, and in that case, Haitians have the lowest rate of defensive sustained uh, uh, 
responses to uh, deportation orders issued to respondents uh, who are Haitian lower than regimes that are mass murder uh, uh, for many, many decades. Of course, we've got mass murder in Haiti now, and Haiti perennially has had the highest rate of violent human rights violations of any country not in open civil war. We may be approaching some kind of uh, medium intensity warfare between the gangs and the government at this moment, but historically a terribly violent human rights record considering the, the absence of armed conflict in, in the more formal sense. And yet Haitian has the lowest rate in spite of the fact that Haitian has the highest, Haitian Americans and uh, Haitian immigrants have the highest rate of upward social mobility of any immigrant group in the United States. Like all immigrants, the crime rate among Haitian immigrants is much lower than of US citizens. Uh, and generally speaking, uh, Haitians now occupy all positions in society, many, many famous people in all walks of life, including an intellectual diplomatic and government affairs, as well as in business and medicine. In the representation of Haitians uh, in this <clears throat> system in the United States, uh, I want to turn attention to the Del Rio incident because it illustrates a couple of key uh, recent developments. First, instead of interdicting Haitian boat people to high seas, we now have the migration of Haitians since the 2010 earthquake, primarily to Brazil, the hero, hero soccer country for Haitians, as well as to Chile. In uh, Chile, they're welcome more or less, Ecuador more or less welcome in much smaller numbers, but in Brazil, the economy went south the racism in Brazil, largely unspoken, was directed against Haitians uh, and they made their way north. The pull factors in the United States came about dramatically with the dramatic increases in 2021 when the word was out that Biden would let in many, many people. Uh, this route through the Southwest border, in spite of the fact the Southwest border is highly closed by a wall, and effectively closed by a cyber wall in which the own statistics from ICE, the uh, Immigration Customs Enforcement Agency, indicate that 80% of the people who make an attempt in the United States never make a second attempt because they get caught. Um, this is because of this interdiction policy, which I mentioned earlier, is in violation of the law and will be looked at, I think, 100 years from now as a, a kind of official piracy where the United States uh, is regarded as an international outlaw, but is never mentioned. This interdiction policy was the primary reason, according to former U.S. Ambassador to the, of, ha of, of the United States to Haiti uh, during the, the Aristide exile period. He said, we intervened because of the boat people, because of Florida, because we didn't want black people invading our shores, even though we had the wet foot, dry foot policy for Cuba, where any Cuban was allowed automatic asylum if they reach the United States, a policy that continued until the end of the Obama administration. Um, the US Constitution says that everyone is entitled to equal protection of the law. It doesn't say only citizens. And yet we see that uh, black Haitians, more typically than not, are treated the way black Americans are treated in the asylum system. Uh, I think I'm almost out of time, but let me just say, why is there pushback in favor of Haitians? And let me just say that uh, we have pushed back precisely because we have a civil rights movement that also coexists with the populist, nationalist, xenophobic uh, movement that's taken over the leadership of the Republican Party. That the NAACP Defense Fund, that various Im immigration clinics, various the, the Congressional Black Caucus, which was so instrumental in pushing for US intervention to reinstate Aristide, was instrumental in the 24 hour reversal of US policy at the Southwest border in the case of Haitians. It was really remarkable that uh, the leave people in Mexico policy that Biden insisted continuing that Trump had said that you have to remain over there instead of your legal statutory right to apply for asylum at the border. Uh, Chuck Schumer, the Senate majority leader heavily criticized the Biden administration for saying this was absolutely illegal. Biden had a revolt. And then he said, okay, we're gonna at least let those who have not already returned because we had announced over the weekend that we're not gonna let anyone into the United States. 
and 7,000 of the estimated 15,000 Haitians are in removal proceedings, but they're in the United States, largely not in detention, as by the way, most people now are not in detention who are irregular people, but they're given an ankle bracelet and given a court date to show up. So that 7,000 people have made it, but Biden has announced there's a remain in Mexico policy until you get your asylum hearing, if you even can qualify one going forward. Um, there's a lot more to talk about, but I think I've covered the main points. So at this point, we'll welcome questions or comments from panelists and or the audience. Please put it in the chat uh, and we'll, um, unless Julio can have people from the audience come up yes. on the video. Thank you so much, Chip. And thank you to all the presenters who gave us some very provocative remarks. Um, there's a very active and engaged um, conversation going on in the chat. I think all of the panelists should take a look at the chat. But for now, we have one hand up, um, Francois. Um, Pierre-Louis has been waiting patiently to ask his question. I'm going to unmute you, uh, Francois, so you can um, speak directly. Uh, thank you. Uh, let's see. Let me put the. Uh, I'm, uh, let me see if I can put the camera. On. I don't need to put the camera on, right? No, your voice is fine. We're, okay. we're hearing you loud and clear. All right. Thank you. Uh, Thank you for the presentations. I really appreciate you know, all the um, comments that I've made, but I have some issues with, with Ann Fuller's, um, some of the comments that I've made. I know, Ann, you are living in Haiti. You are really in the um, midst of all these things and you are personally you know, been affected by it. Uh, although I was in Haiti in, um, in uh, end of August and I, I know how, you know, and I, I'm in touch with a lot of people in Haiti, firing family members that are having the same situation and they are confronting the same problems. But and I think the idea of US occupation, this is something we should, if anyone anybody who loves Haiti, we should discourage it at any time, all the time. We have to remember, every time there was a US occupation in Haiti, it came to protect the very people who had caused the problem. When the US occupation came after Aristide left in 2004, it came to protect the group 184. It came to protect the private interest. It came to protect the same, very same people that were anti-democratic, that fought the popular movement. And the US occupation reinforced their position. Secondly, I think we should be careful about the narrative because it, it, the, the narrative that's out there is as if Haitians are unable to govern themselves. Instead of presenting the roadblocks that have been imposed on Haitians to govern themselves. The, uh, since 1991, summary killings of popular move, uh, leaders, the US, uh, USAID plan to destabilize democracy in Haiti by providing visas, uh, the right wings are uh, killing of many organizers. The uh, you know um, trying to dehumanize groups. In fact, <clears throat> we know that there have been a lot of labor leaders that have been killed. There have been a lot of activist students that have been killed. Whenever you have a leadership that's rising, they are killed or they are put on the side. One of the issues I think we have about address, why is it that Haiti is the only country that's supposed to have a core group, what we call friends of Haiti, so-called friends of Haiti, and they're really the colonial power in Haiti, the, uh, you know, deciding this thing, uh, you know, the future of Haiti. I think we have to switch the narrative instead of being helpless people to a people that have been, have had roadblocks at every time. The next thing I, um, so I think we have to be careful with the narrative. The second thing, uh, Chip, I'm, I thank you for your comments about the um, Haitians being, you know, pressuring on the um, Biden administration. But one thing I would add to your comment, uh, Chip, is the fact that there's an increasing number of Haitian Americans that have, uh, that whose um, vote is, uh, you know, make decisions in terms of who gets elected. When you look at New York, 
Evel Clark, Mix. You look at Florida, look, look at um, places like Massachusetts. So therefore, it is in the interest of those politicians also to pressure the Biden administration, otherwise they won't get elected. So I think um, um, we have to, uh, I'll stop there. Thank you. I didn't, I didn't see where I can turn my camera on. That's why I didn't tell you. Thank you, Francois. Can I uh, respond? Absolutely. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Francois, very much. I agree that U.S. intervention and U.S. military occupation is a, is a bad thing. It has very bad consequences. Um, I do. And I also read, com read comments about um, criticizing me for uh, talking about Somalia and a racist discourse on, on Somalia. Uh, Somalia is a country that, that lost its status as a full nation state. It, it disintegrated in fighting between, between groups. Um, yes, Somaliland is a success, um, but it is, you know, we want Haiti's Northeast and North to secede and create a, 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 a country that works here, that works. I don't think so. Um, I want, I just, uh, I'd like to mention a, a poll that's conducted by IT Nouvelia. Um, this, is, this is not their first poll. They've done a couple of them and they've sometimes been controversial because they, um, they certainly don't fi have findings that uh, go along with what most of civil society is saying. But this was conducted August 4 to September 9th, a thousand people uh, scientifically designed, as far as I know. Three out of four respondents said in solving, in addressing the crisis, the that the international community has a role to play. The largest number saying it should sit down with Haitian actors and help find a solution. 35% wanted the US or the UN to send military forces establish to establish stability for elections. And 10% want the US to assume control of Haiti. Um, it's, it's kind of shocking, but I think there are, there's a lot of people out there in, in, in Haiti that are, are, that are desperate and see and have no hope of Haitians resolving the problem themselves. And I'm not say I'm not for that. I'm, I think it's terrible, but um, it's there. People, people are talking about it. Thank you. Thank you. If I may respond really quickly to Francois. Uh, Francois, first of all, it's just simply not true that Haiti is the only country with a core group. Practically every crisis in the United States has leading diplomats that get some kind of moniker name like the core group. Uh, so in that, in that case, Haitian exceptionalism is not so exceptional. Their influence, you can argue, is more is greater in Haiti considering the power imbalance, but that would depend on the context. Uh, second, I would point out one thing, which is a dilemma that ought to be considered explicitly in all its nuances. Uh, Minusta did face the initial uh, kidnapping for ransom crisis by the organized crime gangs uh, within Port-au-Prince. And it was very, very intense, 2005, 2006. The response was to eventually, after the failure of negotiations, to bomb civilians in Cité Soleil over a four month period uh, that killed at least a dozen people and showed that the peacekeepers were unwilling to discriminate between non-combatant civil, uh, civilians and uh, organized criminals who could have been arrested by other means. It did suppress kidnapping for ransom by about 80%. Now we are in a position where Haiti, as has been reported, has more kidnapping per capita than the next nine countries in the world put together. Uh, so this is a problem that has paralyzed the country that Anne and others have pointed out, uh, this kind of dirty war that the UN fought against the organized crime games cannot be replicated. It's, it's not legal, it's not sustainable, and it's only ephemeral in its effects. It would require a permanent presence of foreign troops to suppress the gangs. Uh, I don't have an answer on how to do it in a more nonviolent way, but uh, it's true that since 2017 and Minusta's 
uh, departure from the country, the organized crime problem has exploded in the country and it ought to be admitted that MNUSTA for all its problems uh, did suppress that problem. I'm not saying on balance it was worth it to have foreign occupation, including the reasons that Francois mentioned. Thank you. Um, Marie, Marie Jose, um, I'm going to unmute your mic so you can ask your question. All right. Uh, it is not really a question. It is just I wanted to make, well, maybe to raise more questions indirectly. But I wanted to make a comment, a parallel with the situation in Jamaica, because I live in Jamaica. And uh, I think that uh, between uh, 1980, 90, and uh, 1993 in Jamaica, we were in a situation almost uh, like the one that is uh, taking place in Haiti, but it did not develop to the extent that it has in, in Haiti. And uh, I was wondering what would be the explanation, if, the, if there is an explanation to the fact that the Jamaicans, even though currently there are still gangs in Jamaica, there are still violence in Jamaica and the, the crime rate in Jamaica is higher than in Haiti, all this taken into account, yet in Jamaica, the, the government is able to govern and the economy is able to function. And uh, I, so I wonder what I would say saved Jamaica from uh, taking the path of Haiti. And uh, I noticed that one thing, and uh, maybe it was due to American pressure, uh, the Jamaican, between inverted comma, sacrificed their gang leaders, both on both sides, because there are only two parties in Jamaica. And I think also that the, the economic sectors, the, the, the big companies in Jamaica did not play the, they did not, play in the hands of the gangs. Because I remember the issue of extortion money was uh, always on the forefront in Jamaica. Uh, I don't mean that uh, extortion has stopped, but what happened is that extortion has not been able to stiffen the economy. So, so the, and also, uh, I think that the police and the army have managed to, to keep out of their involvement in the gang and the, in the corruption. Even though I remember there was a period of time where the police was uh, criticized and uh, the corruption of the police was denounced. Uh, I don't know if there is a 100% improvement, but still, uh, I think that there have been possibilities to limit the negative and deleterious effect of the guns in Jamaica. May I may, may, may I make a quick a quick comment response to that? I think one of the pieces in Jamaica that did occur was that because of the police. Uh, the professional the professional police force remains in place in Jamaica. Also, Jamaica, the Jamaican two sides of the Jamaican political system did not align themselves to the gangs in the way that they would allow they, they, they allow the extreme situation. Remember, there was a gun court. There was they actually uh, prevent importation of guns from, uh, in Jamaica and things like that. So the Jamaican system and community, I think, they rejected the gangs in some ways. I think what happens is that Haiti is so divided and polarized that many sides are take uh, aligned them with different camps and different gangs. And basically the political system has become fragmented and the gangs are part of our political system at this point. So the rule of law never broke down in Jamaica, even though insecurity in Jamaica was, for example, I remember Bob Marley was shot uh, in, in, in the late 70s, almost 80s. So that, that, it was that crucial. But it's in Jamaica actually rallied against that and never let the rule of law disappear. 
Can I suggest something? Uh, I think one of the great differences is essentially the collapse of the Haitian state. And we must look at the policies that contributed to that collapse. And in my mind, there is no doubt that the role of the international financial institutions in terms of marginalizing the state from the process of development has contributed to that vacuum of power. And in addition, you have, as uh, we just mentioned, the realities that political parties, businessmen have allied themselves to the gangs, have actually nurtured the gangs. And the issue now is that the gangs have become autonomous and they can challenge the very people who've created them. So you have some policy coming from the international arena. And this is something that we should never <laughs> underestimate the role of neoliberalism in the destruction of the state. Uh, so that's one big issue. The other issue, as I've said in my presentation, is that you do have political parties, political authorities in Haiti that are gaining from the crisis and have a vested interest in maintaining those relationships with the international community. So it's a very complicated system. It's not just the international community. It's not just the internal political uh, structures. It's a combination of both reinforcing each other. And this is why I'm so worried about the possibility of an international intervention. International interventions are palliative. And once they exit, they haven't changed anything in the substance of the deep structures of inequalities in Haiti that are in the first place, the reason why we have that problem. Because what we are talking about when we talk about uh, uh, a zero sum game, it's essentially in the capital city among the political elite and the business elite. The rest of the country is not part of the conversation. It's ignored. So you have the same phenomenon that has been part of the Asian history. The Mouna Deor, who are not recognized as legitimate citizens. And when they try to change the situation, they are immediately repressed. So we need to look at the class structure and the connection between the dominant groups in Haiti and the international community and how their interests converge. And that interest is not in the national interest, or I should say in the interest of the vast majority of Haitians. And we've seen that throughout history. I mean, when we had, for instance, Hillary Clinton going to Haiti and basically selecting who's going to be the next president. This is something that exemplifies that convergence of interest between some powerful groups in Haiti and the international community. Thank you very much, Robert. Uh, we have 30 seconds if any other panelist wants to say anything. Hearing nothing, um, I will want to thank the Haitian Studies Association and its leadership, um, uh, not just Mark and Regine, but all of those on the committee that work so hard, all the technical support people, Julio and the rest of the translators, uh, Paul and Nadej among them. I wanna thank our panelists uh, very, very much for their participation. And I wanna thank our audience, all 62 of you, plus the panel, including the panelists uh, who have joined us today and those who may be live streaming elsewhere around the world. Thank you for your attention. Haiti drops off the front pages for most of the time, except when it's not. And it's important uh, that this country get the attention that it deserves, uh, considering its role in history, considering its contributions to the American economy and political society. And I guess we're out of time. So I wish you all a good rest of the conference. Bye-bye. Thank you so much, um, Chip, all of the panelists. We have more conference to go. There's another series of concurrent sessions starting at 1245, followed by the business meeting and the awards ceremony. So we hope to see the same group um, again later on today. Take care. Thank you. Thank you. Good to be with all you all. Right. We could.